Today, two shots accompany the sunrise and call Duane and his anti-poaching team on the alert. This has become quite usual in this Zululand reserve in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Moving from reserve to reserve in the past 10 years that I've been, been working in the bush as a ranger, it's, it's, it has its ups and downs. Every day on alert and every day increasing his efforts to avoid another rhino getting killed. But these efforts are constantly draining and increasingly in vain. The rhino is a species that is over 40 million years old. It has no natural predators and today is a rock in the wildlife ecosystem. Rhinos are being increasingly hunted for their horn, for an illegal trade and a demand that is perpetually driven by myths from across the world. They are attacked, shot, and mutilated on lands that have been their habitats for millions of years. All because of the false belief that their horns have powers of potency and healing. The truth is, rhino horn is nothing more than simple keratin, the same as a human fingernail. The situation has become critical, and whilst this devastation continues to drive more support from groups and communities alike, it is still not enough. The rhino poaching in South Africa and in Africa has been going on for many years, but has escalated the past five years. It's simply because of demand. There is a lot of money involved in this illegal wildlife trade and the demand is growing. Because the demand is growing, more criminal syndicates enter and more criminal syndicates recruit poachers to poach in our park. And whereas five years ago we had a double digit, we last year lost over 800 rhino in the Kruger National Park alone. Rhino are poached ruthlessly and in increasing amounts every day because of the myth around the medical purposes of rhino horn prevalent in Asian culture. As far as I know, people are killing the rhinos to get their horns to sell on the market because they're worth quite a lot of money in the market. I don't understand why, because the rhino horn is just keratin. It's the same as our fingernails, so I don't know why people are hacking the faces off these rhinos just to get fingernails. Some doctors refuse to talk about this or explain the reason and value of what has become recognized as simply myth. I can't explain because uh, if we, it's, um, it's been banned, we, we can't say anything about final No. Even behind closed doors, the topic of rhino horn is tabooed with suppliers and consumers alike. Although the communities around anti-poachers are beginning to understand the nature of the problem. Overseas as well, in the Asian countries, the rhino horn is also for medicinal purposes and now it's also a status thing, you know? They can put it in their house and they obviously get uh, recognized for having this item in their house. It's like now they're sort of increasing their status within their neighborhood or whatever it is. Aside from status, myths around medical benefits of rhino horn still drive a large part of the demand. The, the culture behind obtaining things like horn and tiger penis and whatnot is um, quite, well, I think it's commonplace in China and a lot of the myth behind it is mainly to do with sexual performance and people like to consume these products to improve their sexual performance. Um, obviously, it's not justified. There's no guarantee that having tiger penis is going to make you any better because it, it, is, it isn't. In Vietnam, demand for rhino horn has grown exponentially in the last few years from more and more claims that it has cured cancer and other deadly disease. For some time now, and in some communities, mixing rhino horn into cocktails as though it possessed some kind of psychoactive effect has become almost fashionable and a sign of prestige in some circles of the wealthy and elite. This vanity and trend plays its part in explaining why the price on the black market is higher than that of gold or even cocaine. 
the issue of rhino and black market trade extends far past the control of demand driven by myths in Asian culture. It has become a global problem. We are no longer only dealing with the extinction of a species that is over 40 million years old, but a demand for a substance that is attracting the darkest methods of the black market trade. The deeper we dig in, a more complex situation unveils itself. South Africa is home to the largest concentration and population of rhino on the planet, and along with it, the most targeted and entrenched poaching issues. Whilst the problem is most prominently apparent in South Africa, countries such as China, Vietnam and Mozambique are equally complicit in the trade. All with governments and institutions that seem to only shyly comply with international protection recommendations. As a recent example, in April 2016, the South African Court of Justice ruled in favor of legalizing rhino horn trade within its borders. Although this decision has not affected the ban on international trade imposed by CITES, it has been a step closer towards the legalizing of the rhino trade, which in itself is an extensive question frequently debated at all levels. After this ruling, whilst poaching will still be illegal, poachers are now able to freely move rhino horn within South African territory, but are still faced by the challenge of smuggling it internationally where they can command extensive prices and profits. In addition to the tragedy of finding more and more dead rhinos, there is the horror of the suffering that they endure after being shot and mutilated. With their horn removed, rhinos will struggle for hours before they die, even with help from humans who find that sometimes there is nothing they can do. Too often, the damage is too extensive and not recoverable. This is Timba, a rhino found after poachers had mutilated him for his horn. Despite best efforts from vets trying to save him, the damages were so extensive, he couldn't recover the movement of his leg and drowned after 14 days of struggle and suffering. Some of the closest vets cannot help but feel fully responsible for the cruelty of humanity. I think people start to realize that a lot of people shoot rhino and get away with it. I mean, we've caught a couple of poachers here already. And the one guy said to us, he says, you know, I get 70,000 rand for this little horn. That's three years salary for me. You understand? So, and even you take from Mozambique, something like 78% of the rhino shot in Krugers from Mozambicans. They live, it's the poorest country probably in Africa. But now they're suddenly building brick houses, got TV screens, all from rhino horn. So now that the, the ball is rolling, ah, oh, look what John's got, a new home, he's got a brand new vehicle, wow, he's got a TV, oh, hey, he's got a cell phone, oh. So now they all want to jump on the bank and start hunting. In the Kruger Park, there's nothing less than 20 poaching gangs every day, hunting poach, uh, elephant and rhino. The, the reason why there are more poachers poached every day now is because everybody is aware and seeing their friends becoming so well off with so much money and making so, so benefiting from the rhino. Do you know that the Mozambicans, and I've had the bullet detectors of the park on rhino that by us that were dead, and they said to me, Brian, they follow the tracks of a poacher. When they get to the Mozambique border, the poachers stand at the side and say, thank you for the horn. 
and the commodity, the communities there, they lift him up on his shoulder and they walk, hero, because that money is going to the infrastructure. They're building homes, schools, clinics. They've got uh, brick houses, uh, four-wheel drives, a, cat, a boma to protect their cattle from line. They're benefiting, the community is benefiting, as opposed to how they used to live before with the old shack, couldn't go to school, a child, no shoes, a malnutrition, snot running out his nose, you know, so how are you going to stop that? So what happens is, what's happening now is the rich guys, the schemers in the background, go to an innocent little guy who hasn't got much food and said, here's 50,000, and I know this for a fact, here's 50,000 rand in your pocket now, here's a rifle, go there, they got rhino, and he's the one going, the innocent guy, and my heart bleeds. I've actually caught poachers, and I said to my wife, my heart bleeds, I said, honey, when I brought him home, I said, give him, make some sandwiches, give him some coffee. I said, Mr. Chorpy, no, don't come again, please. Do you understand? That's the innocent one. So these innocent guys who've got no education, can't even write, get caught up. And I tell you, I'd go the same way. If a guy put 50,000 rand in my, he hasn't had that in his whole life. And he's a rifle. So those are the guys that are actually getting shot to the park and getting caught, innocent. So it's a middleman who's now liaising with the exporters from Maputo out to China and to Asia. In a country where employment is scarce and with no legal minimum wage, the average household survives on less than 2,300 rands a month, approximately 160 US dollars. The opportunity to earn $50,000 to poach a horn becomes very tempting. In the context of the black market, the price of gold is $40,000 per kilogram, whilst the price of rhino horn is almost double at $75,000. And if you consider that the average weight of a horn from an adult rhino is between four to five kilograms, that means an average rhino horn can range in value between 300 to 400,000 US dollars. Even if the poachers only receive a portion of that, it is no surprise that the risk for reward is very attractive. Sheila believes that these issues can be addressed within communities if they are given opportunities. Her initiative, Dance to be Wild, works to educate children through dancing to engage with these issues for a better future. That's what happens with poverty. You get the exploitation of people that are battling for money and they are being offered a huge amount just to go and kill a, a rhino. But yet they're not making all the money. You get your, your kingpins and the people taking it overseas, that's where the millions is being made. And I really believe a lot of the poachers are actually be another form of exploitation of Africans. However, as a long-term solution, this cannot resolve the whole problem on the ground today and rhino are still being hunted and anti-poaching efforts continue. Yeah, we're based up in KwaZulu-Natal on the northeast coast of South Africa. Um, we are very hard hit by, by rhino poaching and uh, we see probably on average uh, one or two cases a week at the moment of, of, of poaching incidents. This year alone we've lost uh, over 105 rhino um, and now we, we're 1st of December today so the, the year isn't finished yet. And it's, it's been an increase year on year for the last couple of years. And big frustration is that um, we as, as law enforcement, uh, not only as, as the aviation side, but the guys on the ground more, more so, is that we are fighting a asymmetric warfare. Um, and one's got to be careful of the term warfare because the, the criminal or the suspect, they, they can do whatever they want and unfortunately, we are bound by so many regulations and so many rules that uh, it makes our job very, very difficult. Um, and th together with that, I would say a lack of political will and uh, the lack of backing we have um, both locally and internationally in terms of, of making real efforts to address this issue.
Anti-poaching units are extensively trained with tracking and patrolling techniques and are able to cover ground effectively when alerted. Units patrol by air and as well as on the ground, working together to keep track of rhinos and poachers alike. This is never easy, and unfortunately, very often, poachers evade these efforts and flee into the bush. While the anti-poaching unit has to leave the mission with no positive result, the situation is even worse 17 kilometers away, where the storm reached the KwaZulu-Natal region and another rhino died last night. So the incident that happened here that you see is um, during the thunderstorm we had an incursion of rhino poachers that came in and uh, they came across this female black rhino and uh, they took one shot of her on the side which uh, ended up in killing her and removing her two horns. Often vets work in tandem with these teams to help find clues from an attack on a rhino and help understand what happened and track the poachers responsible for another dead rhino. We had a quick look-see to see if we could find uh, the bullet. Um, there was a signal from the metal detector, but it was deeper than we had equipment to get take out. So we've come back again today to redo the whole scene properly and uh, hopefully find, obviously, what killed this particular rhino. The bullet is pretty obvious what happened to it. It's a shot that went in behind the, the left shoulder here, through the uh, top of the heart and bottom of the lungs. And then it's probably impacted somewhere on the inside of the other leg. And that's where we're going to start looking today. Okay. We just had stars rather than red stars, or we we had contacts with people yeah. shooting at each other, and then uh, the blue stars would be where we've had arrests. In order to get better results, anti-poaching units also work with the intel gathering organizations operating within the communities to stop the poachers before they start. Robert is an undercover agent who has been able to infiltrate the poaching community and set up a meeting with known poachers. With any luck, he will be able to gain information about their activity and help the anti-poaching units catch these criminals. The truth stands that as long as a common solution is not agreed upon with a coherent effort to fight and educate toward a common goal, it will not matter how many anti-poaching units are supported and deployed, nor how brave and well-equipped they are, their efforts will not be enough. If we don't face this problem with determination and don't commit to a common goal, the rhinoceros will continue to be hunted to extinction. The CITES Treaty, signed by over 180 countries, including the likes of South Africa, Mozambique, China and Vietnam, where trade is most prominent, 
has banned the trade of rhino horn as far back as 1973. Its goal is to protect endangered species and promote plant conservation by controlling trade of more than 30,000 species through a system of import and export licenses. Nevertheless, CITES recommendations are not always thoroughly applied and during our investigation, it becomes evident that there is a need to explore other solutions. Dehorning the rhino and a possibility of a controlled and licensed trade is one of the initiatives that people are defending in order to address demand, make rhinos less attractive to poachers and save the species. If we dumped five tonne of rhino horn in Vietnam every year, which is what we are capable of doing without killing rhino, how is that going to increase the killing of our rhino in the Kruger National Park? I think if you have a logic mind, you will answer that question that it's not going to increase the killing of the rhino, it's rather going to decrease the killing of the rhino. Um, we don't normally dehorn black rhino because they use their horn on a day-to-day -day basis because they eat leaves, so they need to manipulate trees and move them about and stuff. Um, white rhino, they eat grass, and they don't really need their horn. The only thing rhino use their horn for is to fight one another. Um, it's much safer for our rhino if we dehorn them because they're much less attractive to poachers. Obviously, if they can get a complete rhino horn, it's worth a certain amount of money, and if they can only get a little bit of horn, it's worth a bit less. So you still get some amateur poachers who go after them, but like the organized crime, they, they would rather go for a complete horn on a rhino. It doesn't really do the white rhino any harm. They, they carry on, they still eat, breed, sleep, play in mud, whatever, eat grass. So, and then in about three years, the horn simply grows back again anyway. So if you dehorn them, you have to do it constantly. While it still looks brutal, the rhino does not suffer any pain, and the vets work together with the team to help the animal to have the least disturbing experience possible. The rhino are usually darted from a helicopter, but occasionally from the ground in smaller reserves. Eyes and ears are covered to prevent noise, disturbance, and damage from the saw. A pen is used to mark the point of removal, usually seven centimeters from the base of the front horn, and five centimeters from the base of the back horn. While under anesthesia, a chainsaw or handsaw is used to cut the horn off horizontally. The stump is trimmed to remove excess horn at the base, 
then smoothed and covered with Stockholm tar to prevent cracking and drying. Although this solution seems to contribute in reducing the number of rhinos poached, some people claim that dehorning is incredibly costly. Due to the effort of finding the animal and the costs associated with the immobilization process, especially if needed on a recurrent basis. The actual cost depends on several factors, but it is estimated to be from 620 US dollars per animal in the Kruger National Park to $1,000 in private reserves. Not everyone supports the dehorning of rhino and legalizing of trade. It is an issue much disputed across the world, but there are people still betting on saving the rhino with this alternative. One of our problems with rhino survival is that a dead rhino is worth more than a live rhino. So if we can change that, and we could easily change that with legalization, because at the moment, it's not, again, I say it's not the demand that is killing the rhino, it's the way that demand is supplied. We are putting more emphasis on saving the horn rather than saving the rhino's life. And if we legalize the trade in horn, the rhinos in this country will immediately double and triple in value because people will be able to perpetuate the breeding of them, which they can't now. The market out there is so big, you know, um, some guys have got the attitude of they'll flood the market. It's impossible to flood the market. We haven't got enough rhinos, we haven't got enough water in the sea to flood the market there, you know, so I don't personally agree with that. The conversation and whether it will have a positive or negative impact is ongoing, and arguments for both sides are plausible and prevalent. Look, it's like a, a temporary stopgap. They're still shooting rhino horns off because he's going in the full moon hunting and he looks, he sees a rhino car. They've even shot hippo by mistake at night, thinking it's a rhino. So that's a vision they've got in the full moon. So they see the cock, they shoot it and it's got no horn. But then they still take that little bit, which is worth 100,000 rand. So it might be a slight detergent, but it's not ultimately the, the answer. As a person, I'm totally against that. I think we've got to remember that the trade in rhino horn is controlled by criminals. By legalizing it, what are we endorsing? And also, if you legalize it, what measures have we got in place to actually control that legal trade? When, if we look at what's happening today, we don't even have the capacity to control illegal trade. There's no solution. The only way is you have to put them in barricaded camps with heavy armed rifles because they can all be wiped out. Sorry, and most of the, even the rangers themselves, a lot of them are involved. They're all involved, underhand, underhand, underhand. Six point eight. 
Well, you've got to get to China and Asia, but you're not going to change them. You say, how do you believe that rubbish? It's the same as a horse's hoof. He'll say to you, why do you believe in Easter Bunny and Tom Thumb and Christmas Day and Father Christmas? That's rubbish too. So don't condemn us. Mm -hmm. So you can't, the pot can't call the kettle black. So we have a problem. However, many resources have been put towards addressing the problem and anti-poaching units increase their efforts every day to avoid having infiltrators. In Africa, policies against ivory trafficking have been successful and there is a sense that this will pave the way for the rhino. So the importance would be to educate all parties involved that as with elephants, we can work towards making a living rhino much more valuable than a dead one hanging as a trophy on the wall. In 1982, Japan was the world's biggest rhino horn importer. It was only after its population gained awareness of the situation that their practices changed, and nowadays the myths have been dispelled and demand practically annulled. The same shift occurred in South Korea, where awareness and education played a far more effective part in resolving the problem. Changing one market alone will not solve the problem, and a global effort must be made if a true solution is to be found. To me, it was, we said to the Vietnamese, we are never going to sell you another rhino horn. Not through hunting, not through live dehorning of rhinos. We are not going to sell you another rhino horn ever again. Go away. They did go away. They went to Mozambique and did a deal with the poachers in Mozambique. And that's where they are being supplied from now. Rhinos that are being killed for, to supply that demand. Where most of these poachers, over 90% of the poachers are actually coming from, from Mozambique. So we have a, a, an understanding, we have a working relationship with our counterparts on the other side of Mozambique. As you might know that we actually form part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area, which means we are able to manage these uh, protected areas beyond our national borders. So the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area consists of South Africa, which is the Kruger National Park, uh, uh, Mozambique, which is uh, the Limpopo National Park on their side, and also Zimbabwe, uh, Gonaraseu uh, uh, National Park. But we're experiencing a lot of uh, problems within, uh, you know, between ourselves and, and, and Mozambique. So we have working relationships with uh, Eastern uh, Asian countries as well, like uh, China, uh, Cambodia, um, Vietnam, where our Minister of Environmental Affairs is actually leading you know, discussions in terms of how do we ensure that uh, citizens of those countries understand the magnitude of uh, this uh, big uh, you know, threat on our natural heritage. Anti-poaching units have to patrol the borders in all areas where poachers can go to get a rhino horn. There are hundreds of miles to be covered in a land with about 20,000 rhino. But in the meantime, the vets who discovered the carcass of the rhino poached in the last thunderstorm have realized that it was a mother and they have lost the baby calf from the scene. Baby rhino are very fragile without their mother and usually can only last about 24 hours alone. The rangers and rescue party now have to work against the clock if they are to avoid finding yet another carcass. Unfortunately, this female that we've been found uh, poached, unfortunately she has a young calf and uh, we need to find her um, relatively quickly because yeah, she has around 20 hours. Um, you know, then otherwise predators can get hold of her, lack of milk from the mother. So uh, yeah, we've lost the mother, but uh, we need to find this baby. We don't want to lose two at the same time, so it's really important that we, we, we get down on the ground and find this baby.
the sad thing is uh, she had a baby um, that's orphaned. But the good thing is we found it in time. So we managed to save that baby. So yeah, that gene can carry on. That's not the end of them. Um, I think that was, you know, besides losing the, the mother, we managed to save the baby. And I think that has a, you know, has a good end to that story as well. Rhino can live up to between 40 or 50 years old. The average calf spends the first two to three years with its mother before becoming completely independent. So depending on when a rhino is rescued, the caring and reintegration process lasts anything from two to five years or until the rhino seems able to share with other rhinos and defend itself. In some cases, the rhino is never ready to go back into the wild. Petronelle and her organization, Care for the Wild, focus on the rescue and recovery of orphaned rhino and ensure their survival and eventual reintegration into the wild. I was actively involved in the hand rearing rehabilitation rescue of all species and um, as well as training in the chemical immobilization as, as well as rehabilitation and care of all, all species. She has rescued over 200 rhino and has kept them under her care for between two and ten years, and sometimes even more. Uh, yes, so do we want to be the generation that loses them? There's no way that you will let them lose. Okay, the future. Hey, we're going to have a lot of rhino. Yeah, you know. If we, we have to focus on their life. There's enough people saying, you know, look at this carcass, look how they, what they've done. We must say, hey, there's a lot of them still alive. Make sure they stay alive. To keep them safe, all these organizations work together, even with other departments to improve the results. We run a security company that operates quite over a large area with a lot of people. We employ about a thousand people in the company. And out of that, um, we get good information that's fed to us. Um, although it's not our primary work, we get a lot of information regarding various crime and crimes and criminals in the area. Um, now, we we try as much as possible to take that information and give it to the right persons. And from there on, they can take it further. As that conversation continues to gain information from poachers, their activities are revealed and more details are gathered for anti-poaching units. 100,000. About what the I Oh, uh, seven's way. Yeah. Oh, 
before two weeks. Before two weeks. Yeah, before two weeks. Ah, Okay, Okay, okay. okay. As the discussion wraps up, Robert leaves the poachers with enough intel to ensure sharing it with the authorities. This collaboration with intelligence organizations and anti-poaching units has produced the best results and has allowed the anti-poaching units in South Africa to arrest more than 300 criminals in 2015. With this kind of intelligence at hand, anti-poaching units are better equipped to track poachers and close in more effectively on potential hunting spots. So as the sun sets, the rangers begin their search. They suspect that within these grounds, poachers have targeted nearby rhino and are lying in wait. The team have a first sighting and prepare to approach potentially armed poachers. But to preserve life, not only of this species, but of all those that are endangered, demands our awareness, a global change of paradigm and an approach to taking action. Unless old patterns and methods are shaken off, any containment policy that is implemented will not be enough. In my personal opinion and, uh, is that unless we have a, a change in government thinking, um, we are not going to save the rhinos. Never in the world any government could save any species. It's private privately driven um, and unfortunately our current government is not serious about rhino poaching. It's only the past few months that rhino poaching has been a priority crime. Um, it should have been prioritized five, six years ago. We could have been so much further now. Um, and unfortunately the amount of, of um, people and money they, they're pushing into this is minute against the problem. You know, so. At least somebody's doing something. 
but uh, this I I'm not very positive currently in the current situation about saving the rhino. We have to change the failed policy. The policy we are following is failing the rhinos miserably. We have to change it and we are running out of time to change it. We are also running out of numbers. The very numbers of rhino that could save it from extinction are being obliterated by the poachers. Whilst governments debate the economics of dehorning, Sangomas understand the problem from a point of long standing ancient values passed down for generations. Sangomas are called to heal and through them it is believed that ancestors from the spirit world can give instructions and advice to heal illness, social disharmony and spiritual difficulties. Would you like to help to protect the rhino? Yeah. How? Telling other um, telling people how, how bad it is to kill the rhino and push them. Teaching kids to dance is fun for children. And children learn better when they're having fun. And we can go and teach them about rhino conservation and what's happening to our rhinos, but how often can we tell them that without rounding it off with something else that they're having fun all the time? And basically, dance lessons give us access to those children on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis. Because as Dance To Be Wild, we eat, sleep, dream about saving wildlife. And that carries through to every part of their day, their week, and it becomes a way of life for them. We don't have to go and actually lecture them all the time, and then, because there's a certain amount of time you've got to do that. And it has to become part of the way they live as African children. They are your animals, and when you're bigger and you've got children, you want to be able to take your children and your grandchildren, and we'll still have these beautiful, beautiful animals. Well, in this fight against rhino poaching, we've got the side in Africa in embracing Africans into conservation. We also have to stop the demand, which is largely coming from the Asian countries. Now, dancing is hugely popular in Asia. And it's really, really important that we use the, this amazing vehicle we've got of dance in the same way that we're doing with Africans, with Asians. <laughs> 
with Dance Be Wild um, and what Sheila is so great at doing um, is that we go to schools and approach them. And we go to schools surrounding places like the Kruger National Park, where many of the children haven't even had the chance to see a rhino. And we are trying to show the locals and the Africans that how they need to embrace their heritage and their wildlife. Um, it's such an important thing for Africa. So the way that we get the children involved is by creating awareness and going and entertaining them. You, you get the attention if you do a great, fun little dance in the beginning. You know, you don't just go and start preaching about the sad things and about the rhino poaching, because any child's maybe going to get bored and you've got to get the attention. So the best way to do that is by dancing. They all love it and they, and they have such a great response. So if the criminal elements approach them, they've got enough self-esteem and enough value of themselves to value the fact that they're South African and wildlife actually play such an important part. And they turn down the criminals that are exploiting them. These are my brothers here, yeah. all of them. So when you talk to people with your mouth, with words, they would listen to you, but I think with a closed ear, because today they'd listen to you, they'd remember it, but they wouldn't take it to mind. But if you'd like, maybe do something like a demonstration to them, show them something that you really mean that, then they would, they would remember that. So we, we dance so that you'd remember us. When you think of coaching a rhino, would remember us and you'd think that I was told not to poach a rhino. So instead of going to poach a rhino, you would dance and try to make a living out of the dancing. They want to know about the rhino. They're starting to cook it because I told them to draw the rhino. Now they want to find out about the rhino. What is the rhino? You see, so by teaching the kids, it will contribute to the future because the these kids will grow up knowing the rhino is important. They will respect the rhino. <laughs> trying to embrace to the children is to love the animals, love their environment, because that is our life and the future of South Africa and the whole uh, Africa. So that's why I was so interested and very happy when I'm doing this with children so that they must know. And then in future, I even think if I had something, I could take them all over the Kruger National Park to see Life, wildlife, so that tomorrow when we dance, we dance with the rhino. Say hello to rhino poaching. Poaching is not only a result of illegal trade, profits, or lack of resources and coherent policies when trying to fight against it. It is an issue that runs deeper, that poses the question what is it going to be? Destruction or conservation? What are we committed to? What are we teaching our future generations? The answers we give to ourselves will depend not only on the survival of the rhinoceros as a species, but also on that of our own.